I would say, of trying to interpret scripture with scripture, which is a good practice that we should have. We always say that, and I will not um, say you should remember the, the Latin phrase that is, those are some of the things that we hold to, scripturum, scripturum, scripturum interpretum, or scripturum suis interpretes. Scripture interprets scripture, or scripture is its own interpreter. And so you have to look at the scriptures, and if something may be unclear, you go to another passage of scripture where if it is the same author, which always helps, who talks about a similar topic, if you go there as a cross-reference, you may find that they complement uh, one another, or the same author is addressing the same issue and is elaborating on it maybe clearly in another passage. And so that's what people have thought about 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to 10 and Romans 14 and 15, thinking that Paul is addressing similar issues. Indeed, he is talking about religious liberty in both. But the angle from which he addresses the religious liberty, I feel is often missed because of the nuance that is there that people often miss. And I will mention some of that in a moment. And so, but this is to let you know that we're going to spend a bit more time here uh, for us to uh, unlearn some of the things that we have heard and learned and Lord willing, and if this is my hope and prayer, to put aside some of the presuppositions that we have or upon hearing the word liberty, thinking that we know what Paul is talking about and so we presume that this is what he means. Or maybe to clarify for those who may not know what Paul means by religious liberty or religious freedom. And so some of the believers who are new in the faith may not know about some of these issues of religious conscience, religious liberty, freedom of religion. But you saw that I titled the sermon Freedom as a Stumbling Block because freedom can be a stumbling block. And one of the reasons that it becomes stumbling block, a stumbling block to us as Christians is something that is problematic in our Christian walk. We become Christians and what often happens is when people get saved, they then come to Christ with things that they may have had or learned or knew before they became believers and then they try to find ways to make those things Christian or biblical or baptize them, as it were. And this is a problem that we have seen many, many times. But the right uh, way to come to Christ is if you come to Christ, you, you come to him after having been brought up from the dead, after having been lived following the powers of this air, of the rulers of this air, doing things according to what the God of this world desires, which led to death. You've been brought out of death, and the death of Christ has brought to you life. And Paul tells us that in Christ Jesus, once you have been saved, you are a new creation, a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And he tells us, as we saw earlier in the study of 1 Corinthians, that you have been bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. You have also been made a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you were not. And so everything about you, we can say more. Once you become a Christian, is new. And if you are a new creation, like a newborn baby who has just come into the world, you have to learn from God then how to live out the Christian life. The young adults, one of uh, Brother and Dew's preparations was to look at what Peter says about our attitude in, if we are going to receive the word of God as a pure milk, like a baby, newborn baby, Estelle, who is at the back. Um, is, is she at the back, uh, Tian, listening to the sermon with Annika? And a newborn baby who longs for the pure spiritual milk of the word. But... There, Peter tells us that there are things that we have to put aside first, and there he's talking to Christians that we put on certain sins. And so he says, after having put aside these sins, then we can long for the pure milk of the word with pure lives 
and we will have an intake of the word of God. But without that, there will never be an intake of the word of God because it cannot be mingled with impurity. It's like if you give a baby uh, milk that is mixed with gall and then expect the baby to enjoy the bitter milk. And so that is what we have to think. We should not insist on our ways. Things that we had before we were Christians, let us not want to baptize them and make them Christian because we are Christians. The traditions, the cultures, and the ways of life that we used to have, we have to critically evaluate ourselves and see whether what we do now aligns with Christ. And this is not to say everything that we did is bad because we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And in his goodness, God still works in the lives of the unbelievers and he still gives us good things. And so God still, by the restraining work of the Holy Spirit, who is called the restrainer by Paul in Thessalonians, restrains our hearts so that people would not become vile and destroy the world. And so unbelieving people still do good, but that good does not glorify God. It is the good that we do in Christ that we have been saved for, as Ephesians chapter 2 says, that glorifies God. And so we have to learn to take from God what he gives us. And my um, burden on the heart this morning is to, to try to say to us, let us evaluate ourselves. Let us check ourselves. And this is what I hope to do with this study of First Corinthians chapter 8 to, to show you that it will challenge many of the things that we, I think, uh, have wrong. And many of the commentators that you will find that you will pick up, and this is one of the other problems with uh, helping the believers understand this passage, that the commentators take at face value what has been said, and what you find is just only a solidification of things that have, not be, that have always been there. And there, there is a, a rarity in terms of people looking deeply and closely into what Paul is saying uh, to check whether is Paul really saying things that we already know and have been taught for many, many years? Or can we look at what Paul is saying here and think carefully about what he says and be changed? And I hope that we will look carefully and closely at what Paul says here for us to be changed. But for those who may not be aware or who may not be familiar with the concept of religious liberty, freedom of conscience, or, uh, yeah, so those terms. Usually these are things that people say, these are gray areas, and I do not want to mention some of the details because there are many, many, many things that we will see and find as, uh, or put in the category of gray areas. And people will say, well, these issues fall within the gray areas of what God allows us to do. And we can do these things, and we should not fight as Christians over these things as to whether this is right or wrong. And so we may have the liberty to exercise or do these things uh, as an exercise of our freedom. And then there will be some of these things then that the Bible explicitly prohibits that people will say we should not go to those things. But I think that distinction falls short of recognizing that Paul here in 1 Corinthians 8, we will see, he is going to, as I said, he, he turns this on his head by saying, well, it actually isn't like that. Freedom or those things that we think may be free or we may be free to do, to do them or fall within the, the realm of freedom of religion can become stumbling blocks. And we have to be very careful because in God's eyes and in God's ways, there are no gray areas. God knows whether what we do is pleasing to him or not. And so we should not rely on ourselves. And uh, we should always be in a community of believers like this. And when we discussed this on Wednesday at Bible study. We saw how important it is for us to be part of the community of believers because we are not going to always know whether what we do is offensive to other people or not. And we are going to step on one another's toes as we try to live out the Christian life. We make many mistakes. And this is the benefit, one of the benefits of being in the body of believers is that your brother or your sister in Christ will come and tell you when 
what you do is offensive or not, or causes them to stumble or not. And we can speak freely to one another. If I've caused you to stumble, if you've caused me to stumble, we are able to ask for forgiveness and seek reconciliation and grow and learn together. Some things, sometimes we may also grow together in areas that may have been seen as stumbling blocks or offensive, may change and not become offensive and stumbling blocks. And that's what we saw here. And the other thing that Paul addresses, that he corrects, is that this distinction that people make, that there are people who are inherently weak as Christians, and there are those who are strong. And people don't understand what Paul means by the use of these two terms to describe believers, the strong and the weak. In Romans chapter 14, what Paul does there is that he shows us that there are times when those who are strong can be weak. So if somebody is strong in the exercise of their religious freedom in Romans, they're not going to always be strong in everything pertaining to their freedom. In other areas, they are going to be weak. So they may be strong in saying, I do not feel that this is offensive, but they may be offended by something that somebody else finds to be within their freedom to exercise and practice. And so uh, there, there isn't this, here is this elite group of strong Christians, and here's this weak group of weak Christians. No, we all have our weaknesses and strengths. When we were at one fraternal, pastor's fraternal, just around 2017, somewhere there, we, so this is a time for pastors to uh, rest. So it is a pastoral retreat for pastors. And we're supposed to rest. And uh, in one of the free sessions that we had at the place where we were at, we were told that you know, there is a vending machine or there is a fridge with drinks. We can freely have drinks. But then they asked us to ask someone to just make, uh, 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 take note of who, was, who took what and then what it costs and then put the money together, give them to uh, the uh, people who were ta caretakers there so they were not going to come every time we needed to take something from the fridge. So they trusted us to take whatever we wanted from the fridge. And I remember one pastor cautioning, saying, brothers, you must also remember that we were not all the same. We, we, we see things differently, and so please try uh, to be sensitive in your choose of a beverage when you go to the fridge. And obviously this uh, place doesn't cater only to believers caters to unbelievers as well, and so there was alcohol in the fridge. And you know that there are some Christians who use alcohol, have a problem, some have a problem with it, some don't have a problem with it. Uh, some don't have a problem with others uh, using or uh, consuming alcohol, and some may have a problem with it. And so we went there, and together with uh, my a friend and with another friend, so three pastors, and then we took out a cold drink, the two of us, and then the other pastor we took out beer, and then he turned and said to us, I know that you pastors, and he used uh, the phrase that I hope you will not uh, uh, dwell on that, but he said, he said, I know you black pastors get offended when we drink beer. As if, uh, even though we were not going to ignore him, but, but just saying that made us think, if, he's, if he thinks that this might be a problem, why insist or why do it if it might cause offense? If you're not sure, as a Christian, what we saw on Wednesday was a good practice is refrain if you're not sure as a Christian. Because refraining is not going to cost you anything. It will, be, it will help you until you are sure and can ascertain whether that is permissible or not. But long story short, there were problems with this pastor. It wasn't just the issue of him using his religious liberty in this way, but he was abusing it and in fact fell as a result of his consumption of alcohol, ended up abusing it because he wanted more and more and more, and that came out, and that was a problem. And so Paul is going to talk about the use of religious 
liberty here. But in a way of cautioning us, causing us to be careful. And I want to also appeal especially to the young adults to be careful, not to adopt some of the ways that some, some people may say are right, and then grow with that, in insisting that these are right, because some of these habits become difficult to get rid of as we grow in the faith. And for those who have been in the faith for quite some time, we have the duty to ensure that we care for one another and ensure that we do not cause the younger believers to adopt things that uh, they may not sure, uh, be sure about, uh, whether they are right or wrong. But let's read then from verse 7 to verse 13 and see what Paul has to say to us there as God speaks to us through his words. And then we will think about this text, again thinking about some of the important things that I want us to think about, and uh, also to add that in some of these, some of the majority of the commentaries, sermons that you might hear, you might not find uh, people who agree with some of how I believe what Paul is saying here, what Paul is saying, or what he means by what he says, but there are those uh, comment commentators in the minority and those pastors in the minority who uh, see Paul differently and take the view that I take of this text. But let us hear God speak to us from verse 7 to verse 13. However, Paul says, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do eat, nor the better if we do not eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his Conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. In this third song that we sang, it's a line about Christ who left the gaze of angels, uh, came to seek and save the lost, and to die on the cross for us, giving himself up. And this is Paul calling us to give ourselves up, to, to not insist on our ways as believers putting one another before ourselves, putting the interest of others before ours. But let me pray and ask God to write the truth of this word on our hearts and help us to understand it. As Paul cautions us there that we do not want to cause those for whom Christ died to stumble. Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you will help us, or knowing that these may be challenging things and the text and also understanding it may be a challenge, but we pray and trust that by your Spirit you write the eternal truths that come from your word on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We are looking at two religious liberty pitfalls to watch out for. Two pitfalls, religious liberty pitfalls, or freedom of religion, that you have pitfalls, that you have to watch out for so that you do not become a stumbling block to the believers. Two religious liberty pitfalls to watch out for. The first is in verse 7 and verse 8 is to reiterate what I already mentioned the week past. And the first is ignorance concerning our access to God. And ignorance, you can say, also concerning our relationship with God and how God wants us to relate to him. And the second is in verse 10 to verse 13, and that is ignorance concerning our affinity to believers. How God wants us to relate and 
to treat one another as God's people. And so we have to watch out that we do not get it wrong in relation to our access to God and the relationship that we have with God. We also have to watch out that we do not get it wrong in the exercise of our religious freedom, the relationship that we have with believers. And so Paul is taking you out of the picture here to say the issue of religious liberty and how you, even you are the one who's living out your religious liberty and exercising the freedom that you have, is not about you and whether your choices are yours. And that is something that is important here and different also from Romans. That here Paul is saying it is about God, first and foremost. And it is about, if we, to let you know what Paul is going to say later, you have to be completely certain and 100% sure that what you do, if you insist on doing it, or not even insist or do it, you have to be saying, this is for God. And God is glorified by it. If you can say that and be that courageous and that bold, then by all means, do it. But if you are wrong, brothers and sisters, you are lying about God. And that is a serious matter. And this is not for you to plead ignorance. And which is why the first point is ignorance concerning your access to God. Don't be ignorant. There is no excuse for ignorance. God judges the ignorant. And then, also, we have to watch out that we don't fall into the pitfall of not being concerned about the believers in the Lord. And if this passage then, and some commentators are helpful in saying what Paul is summarizing for us here, and, and I will do the broad summary, I, I still intend to go into the details of this, which will help us to understand, understand especially chapter 10, which talks about eating foods and all of that, and Paul going back to Israel's history, and also chapter 11, which also talks about how the believers in Corinth abused the Lord's Supper, and you will understand why they abused the Lord's Supper when they got together to eat meat and how they indulged and how even uh, some in the patronage system uh, sat together and neglected those who had le less means uh, and the problems that existed in the Corinthian church. And then you will see how this also continues into chapters 12 to 14, Paul still correcting the believers here and correcting us. And people take the correction and they do not see what Paul is doing here and they want to apply it in a positive light. And that is, I believe, twisting what the intention is here. But if this passage says anything at all to us concerning the ethical debates that we have today as believers, it, it addresses this issue of conscience. Not only conscience, though, but this idea of saying, well, I have this status, and, and this, this status is my right, and I have the absolute right to choose whatever the cost may be to others, and I do not care. And that's what Paul is saying, saying this addresses those people who say, what I do should not really concern others. What does it have to do with you? That would be the attitude. You may not say that, but Paul is saying this is what it amounts to. Because you cannot do something that you say falls within the realm of religious freedom and only afterwards think, well, does it offend Christians or not? You have to ask first before you do it. I've often made this example, as I said, the issue of smoking is one of those that people have brought to me to ask about whether um, the Bible allows it or where do, should we fall there. I, I do not want to give my, my views, uh, uh, strong views there, but I always find it uh, uh, puzzling when people are challenged about smoking and then they will say, what, where are Bible verses that say we shouldn't smoke? 
But the bigger problem there is if they think that this is pleasing to God, the burden is on them to say, here are the verses that say I should smoke. Because they should be asking themselves, or you should ask themselves, before you started doing it, is it God who led you to it? Don't later then say, I'm looking for verses to do it, to not do it. You should have verses that got you into it. And then you can stand on, on those verses. And you're standing on God's authority to say, I'm standing on God's authority. And that is Paul saying, you do not have absolute rights and not considering the costs. And here Paul then clearly addresses this issue. And he is addressing this understanding that people have. But also he is talking about this manipulation of what people call rights. And then in our text, we see that Paul uses the word freedom there and liberty and all of that. But the word that Paul is using here is the word right, your rights. And in South Africa, we should know this a lot because chapter two of our constitution is about the Bill of Rights and has many, many rights, a plethora of rights given to us. And people want to add more and more rights to things that aren't actually um, uh, rights. And yeah, that's where I have some of the problems with where people and how far they want to take the, the uh, constitution in terms of saying certain things are rights. But this is what the Corinthians were doing. And this, is what, this was their stance. And one commentator says that what Paul is saying here suggests that Paul is not aligning himself with the so-called right. Those who say, we have this right. Remember, I made the illustration or, or I told you about one uh, of our lecturers who said, if Paul saw somebody doing something that might fall within the era of religious liberty, you smoking again as an illustration, he'd walk right past and have no issue. Well, I agree with Gardner that Paul is saying, I don't align myself with that. I don't think that my rights or actions and freedoms don't have an impact on other believers. The stance I have as a Christian as default is, does this affect believers or not? I start there. And then this becomes a warning then. If Paul is not aligning himself with those, and he addresses especially those with sinister motives. And then one author uh, talks about how Paul addresses issues that we have in our churches today. Some people manipulate these rights that they have, and then some of them manipulate what we have seen so far as this knowledge, the supposed knowledge that they say they have, that we see in verses 1 to verse 3 of our text. Whether it is intellectual knowledge or spiritual knowledge that people say that they have, that others don't have access to. And, and then they assume from that that they have the right to engage in any behavior that they want to engage in because they have rights and they are protected by God. What Paul is saying and doing here is that that falls within the area of aggressive use of rights. And the aggressive rules, use of rights will lead to others feeling less secure around you because if you are that kind of person who doesn't care what people say, you're going to find Christians staying far away from you and you don't want that. You want Christians to come closer and closer to you. But if you are a person who is careless and always abusing your rights, you are being aggressive. And... Um, you may do it with a smile, and you may be the most loving and soft and kind person, and, and all these good things. It doesn't mean you don't have all those good qualities, but this thing may be a problem. And then, sometimes people may put aside people of certain uh, class or education, or in the area of spiritual gifts, which we will get to, and then become a cause or stumbling block, which is unnecessary. But what Paul is also harking back to, to, for us to think, 
you may not, you, you, uh, you don't have to go there, it is rather a long text, but he is weaving together what he is arguing for, arguing here with what we already saw in chapters 1, verse 18 to verse 31, about the cross of Christ. But in verse 18 of chapter 1, Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And as he ends and concludes it in verse 31, he says, um, let me pick it up from verse 30, but by his doing we are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and justification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so Paul has not left this issue of when we are Christians, we assume immediately the position of weakness. We assume what people uh, uh, presume as foolishness. And so we're not going to insist on our, on our rights. We are going to live the Christocentric life, a life of Christ, Christ who we just sang about, who left the gaze of angels, left the comforts of being in glory and came to live in this world, which is difficult. And if he wanted to, he would have lived this life saying, I have rights and are setting his rights and doing all of that. But he did not live that way. He gave himself up. In Philippians chapter 2, we see how he lived his life and how he put the interests of others before his and how he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He gave himself up for the people. And so this then should be decisive on the issue of knowledge and wisdom the weak and the strong. And true wisdom here that Paul talks about is, is concerning those who are weak and those who people feel are not to, to be regarded as important. And Paul points to us and calls to us at the end of this, of this chapter in verse 13 to be willing to renounce our rights for the sake of the gospel and to not assert our own rights. And to give them up like Christ did, who gave himself up even to the point of the cross. Christ died. And when he died on the cross, brothers and sisters, we should live our lives to show that we believe this. Did Christ die for himself? Did he die for his self-interests? Did he die to say, I am going to show that I am, I am fighting for my rights and my interests and even if it means me being dying, I will do so. Or did he say, I'm not going to revile in return. I know I'm innocent. I can give these things up. And we'll see in chapter 11 and chapter 10, Paul will say, I'm going to live like Christ. In chapter, one verse, chapter, one, chapter 11, verse 1, rather, of First Corinthians, verse 1, of chapter 11 of First Corinthians. Uh, Tan twister there, or I don't know, brain twister. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, which, which actually should be uh, the last verse of chapter 10, where Paul says, imitate, Christ, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But he tells us there what he imitated Christ in. He says he imitates Christ in not offending people, especially when it came to the issue concerning the eating of food, sacrifice to adults, and all of that. He did not insist on his ways and in that way did not offend people. And that is what he, he uh, said he will uh, do. And in fact, let's read uh, what Paul says there, which we will still get to in chapter 10 of First Corinthians, looking from verse 28, 23. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Paul says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that if his neighbor eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all in it. If any, if any of the unbelievers invite you to and want you to to go, eat anything that is said before you without asking questions for conscience sake. 
But if anyone says to you, this meat is sacrificed to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean, I mean not your own conscience, but the other men's. For why is this my freedom? A judgment by other why is for why is my freedom judged by our, another's conscience if i partake with thankfulness why am i slandered concerning that for which i give thanks so you can see paul is talking and reasoning about the tensions there why should my freedom be judged by others paul is saying it should be it's not about you others matter and then in verse 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. See there, Paul is saying, he will please all men, not for his own profit, for the sake of his own profit, but for the sake of others. And this is the Christocentric life that we ought to live and not uh, offend other people. But as I said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, this is where Paul reaches the, the climax of his, of his argument and where he pronounces how sinful it is to sin against brothers and Christus, sisters in Christ. And though Paul sees this as the, 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 the true doctrine that pertains to how we treat the body of Christ, the people of God, the true doctrine of God and his people. Because God and his people are presented by Paul here as if they, they are one. You, you cannot say, I'm, I'm only doing this for God and, and not the people of God. Christ is married to the church. God's people are one with God. And so when we offend the people of God, we are offending God. When we insist on our rights and thinking that what we do and eat or whatever the case may be is pleasing to God and is not pleasing to God, then we are offending God and his people. If we offend his people, we're offending God. And this is why the Apostle Paul if you remember when he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus appeared to him in a vision in the book of Acts, Jesus asked him, he said, why are you persecuting me? And do you remember Paul's response? What he said there to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn there to see what the Apostle Paul said in, Roman, in Acts chapter 9. Because remember in earlier, Paul was there when the believers were persecuted and the stoning of Stephen and uh, when he died. And then the Lord appeared to the apostle Paul when he was Saul at that time. Acts chapter 9 from verse 3. As he was traveling, that is Paul, who was Saul at that time, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. And there you see Paul, Luke telling us, and Paul will repeat this again in Acts chapter 26 when he recounts this account, saying that Jesus said Paul was persecuting him, and Paul was in his mind thinking, but when did I persecute you, Lord? And Jesus was meaning here that by persecuting the Christians, Paul, you were persecuting the believers. Jesus will also challenge us, we won't read there, when he talks about our care and concern for creation, 
when he returns, he will ask us whether we cared for one another and the believers in ensuring that when it is cold like this, they have warm clothes. When they need food, they have food. And some will say, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or homeless or without clothing? And the Lord Jesus will say, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these my children, you did not do it to me. When you fail to serve their believers, you are failing to serve God. If you put your interests first and neglect the interests of the other believers, it is God whom you are failing. Paul was persecuting God, Jesus Christ, again, by persecuting the Christians. And so Robinson will say then, Paul can no longer look into the eye of a Christian without meeting the gaze of Christ after that experience. After having been told by the Lord Jesus Christ, meeting him on the road to Damascus with this flesh light around him, and the Lord saying to him, why are you persecuting me? And Paul being told that by persecuting the Christians, you are persecuting me. Robinson is right in saying to Paul, whenever he looks at Christians, he will always remember that I am meeting here one to whom, for whom Christ died. And I can no longer look into the eyes of a Christian without meeting there the gaze of Christ. It's not saying Christians are, are Christ or many Christ or little Christ. No, but when you see a Christian, you should be seeing Christ. And how precious this Christian is. And then it is a pity that people do not consider what Robinson says here uh, when Paul uh, talks. But then he continues to say that our lives then are not as though we are individuals when we think about our salvation, but we are a community of believers. You are not yourself, you are not a Christian alone. Even though you are saved alone, and in some instances we know that you're going to give an account alone before God, but you belong to a community of believers. And so that should revolutionize your exercise of your freedom and things that you fall within your relig religious liberty. And then we, we see that people have complicated this, this text and have had this problematic a view of how we have to use um, our right here. But uh, the, uh, or Thornton, one of the commentators, says that if Christ identifies himself with each of his disciples, then there must be a sense in which each disciple of Christ represents Christ to others. So this is you in your use of spiritual, of, of religious liberty, and this is how we have to understand Rome, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So if Christ represents, or if uh, 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 Christ identifies himself with each of his disciples, and if you count yourself as a disciple of Christ and you are in Christ, then there must be a sense in which each one of us represent Christ to others in how he lived a life, the cruciform, the selfless life, this laying ourselves down life, this death to self life, the resurrection to new life life, and living in newness of life life. That is why, as I said, when we come to Christ, let's remember that we have been born again. And so we must take on new practices, habits, likes, and preferences and not insist on those that we came to Christ with. We are new. We should seek new ways within the community of the people of God to ensure that we are going to represent Christ wherever we go. And so when we minister to those who people may say that, no, those people are weak in the faith, they are a problem, they must be corrected, they are the ones who have a problem with people exercising the religious liberty, our stance should be, we are going to stand with those who are, regarded as weak. Because the Corinthians lived in a society where this was a problem. 
where society classified people between the rich and the poor, and in the church had this idea of the weak and the strong, and the idea of the wise and the foolish. And as I said, taking this all the way from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see Paul says, we are about the foolishness of the cross. Even if the world sees that foolishness, this is what we are about. We do not pursue and insist on our ways. And so when we see others treated as weak, let's identify with those. And let us minister to them on behalf of Christ as they are brethren and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is terrible then, and it is an affront to God and a betrayal for the ministry that we say that we are involved in if we reflect a way that is self-giving, that only assess our rights, and we do things that only benefit us, and then when we degenerate into the very opposite, being aggressive towards others and destroy the other Christians. And this takes us back to also to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul talk, talks about not profaning, and in chapter 6 as well, the, the very temple of the Holy Spirit. That is you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And he looks also forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, where he's going to say, we, we must be characterized by love. That is why 1 Corinthians 13, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, where Paul is going to say, even in the exercise of our spiritual gifts, that must be driven by love, not by me insisting that this is my gift, I'll do it however I want to do it. Love. Is it loving to other believers? And we saw how in, chapters, in chapter 8, where Paul contrasts knowledge and love and saying, knowledge puffs up, makes arrogant, but love edifies. That theme is still not left. We are to do everything in love. And in the body of Christ, we are to function as those who are loving. And there's this relationship between us and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that is repeated many times in just verses 11 to 13. And it, it, it reflects the priority of love that we must have over just the knowledge and our rights, as Paul says. In verse 12, you see him saying, And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. We do not want to find ourselves there. We want to be loving. And so Paul chooses this life, saying that we are not going to and we will never live this way. We want to never offend one another. And because this is an area where we feel, and as I said, Christians have emphasized the grayness of this area of liber religious liberty and saying that we should not really care or make a big deal out of this. What Paul is doing here, he is elevating this area of religious liberty and saying it isn't gray. He's taking it out of the grayness of, the area of where we've placed it in our theology to say it's as light and bright as day to God and it should be to us. And our liberty then should not offend other believers. And so we should be changed to say, how we live, we have to ensure that other believers are not offended. I'm not going to insist on my right. And then there are other things that Paul does there in, in the Greek that uh, re, re actually result in the, uh, uh, what one commentator says, the ungrammatical idiom that we use in English. That doesn't exist. It's not proper English, but we use it. When we say, or when you say to somebody, don't ever, ever do that again. Try to type that in your um, phone or Microsoft Word. You'll see that it will say, delete one ever there because it's not there. <laughs> don't say ever, ever. But they, that's the point Paul is saying. Paul is saying, don't ever, ever do that again. And your, your stance should be, I will never, ever do this again if it's going to offend my brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no way to emphasize this more. But I will never do it again. That is why in verse 13 he says, if it means 
as Danielena says in her commentary, if it means I will stop eating biltong because it offends people, I will never eat biltong again. <laughs> and then Nicole said, well, that's easy for me because I don't like meat anyways. I eat fish. And I said, okay, let's use fish. And Nicole, if fish offends people, you should never eat fish again. And commentators make a mistake there by looking at Paul and his use of food and meat. And, and Paul is using food and meat and sacrifice to idols here, but the whole point is, is not really about the food themselves. It is about our relationship with God and relationship with one another. And that is why he would even use some of the plural words to define different kinds of meats and whatever, but you don't find those in the temple sacrifices and all that. And, all kinds of cheeses, as some people will say, when there is nothing like that. But Paul is, is saying that whatever we do, if it, if it is an affront, if it destroys the conscience of a, a believer, uh, we, we should never do it again uh, because we do not want to damage the Christians. An early, 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 early commentator, John Chrysostom, commented on this, and he wrote, he preached very early on, uh, uh, a few centuries only after Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians. He says, It is foolish in the extreme that we should esteem as so entirely beneath notice those that Christ so greatly cared for that he should have even chosen to die for them as not even to abstain from meat in their account. Old English, but he's saying, It is foolish to the extreme. If in our practice of religious liberty we do not notice the great work that Christ did for those that he died for, that we still do not notice them. Christ noticed people who are not noticeable. You are not noticeable. You were a vile offender outside of the commonwealth and the promises of God that should belong to those who belong to Christ. And when Christ chose you, there was nothing important about you. You did not stand up, stand out in the crowds and as being important. And so he's saying, if, if Christ chose believers this way, in, in a way that it as if he picked them up and made them special people, and then you see those believers who were chosen by Christ that way, and you don't realize that they have been specially chosen, and then even see that Christ cared for them so great that he even died for them on the cross, something that you cannot do, yet it's so difficult for you to just abstain from eating, from eating meat on their account. That's the argument. How difficult can it be to say, I'm not going to do this so that my brothers and sisters will not be offended? And that is nothing incomparable to what Christ has done for them and for us in choosing us. And this captures the, the very contrast that Paul is saying here. One's right to choose is contrasted here with the love and care that we should have for one another. And so your rights and, and freedom and religious liberty doesn't exist in his own world, as some people say, and say, you have religious liberty, do whatever you want to do. Paul is saying, no, but it should be loving. And if it isn't, if it isn't loving, then you have to look at your conduct. You do not have autonomy and rules and patterns of life and choose what you want to do with your life. No. Our lives must be Christ-centered, not self-centered. And whatever we do should not offend other Christians. We should not even annoy or do things that will cause displeasure, as one commentator says. Even if it is purely subjective, as some people may say, we should care. We should really, really care. Yes, many issues that we may discuss around religious liberty, and I have deliberately avoided making mention of specific things. I plan to do that still and to gather some of those from you. But even if they may be subjective or people may say they are relative from one person to another, one location to another, they matter. 
Uh, that's Paul's point. And everything that we do can cause damage. That is the other point to take home. Your religious liberty may cause damage, uh, brothers and sisters. And you may offend other people. And Pastor Tebuho on Wednesday mentioned when he was um, at home and entered the tent and it was cold at a funeral and had to take off his hat. And there were other men who did not take off their hats and they were told to take off their hats. He said, it was very cold, but I had to do it because you're going to offend people. If it were up to me, I'd be preaching with a hat now, but I won't do it because somebody will be offended and not tell me and I don't want to do that. I've often found myself offending people with my hairstyles and it has been a struggle. Um, and it happens, for real. Uh, people will say, I was saying to someone, I won't mention the name this morning, saying we went, when we used to talk about some of these things as Christians, we always had to check ourselves, even in the previous church where we come from, to say, we, we always had to check even the clothing we picked for church on Sunday to say, I have to make sure that this is not going to offend anybody or this is not going to draw attention to me. Nobody's going to say, hey, you look different. I want to look like everybody. And what we did at that church, we all wore black and white the entire time so that nobody looks like, uh, and it wasn't a church attire or church uniform. And um, it helped because we sang in the choir as well. And so we always had black and white every time. And there was nothing special about how we looked. Uh, but that's taking it to, I think, the extreme, but we can have a healthy way of looking at it and say, I'm, I'm going to be careful. I don't want to offend my brothers and sisters in the community uh, because I may not know. It may be subjective. And so sinning against Christ here and sinning against those for whom Christ died is the point that Paul is making here, that we have to renounce our rights because it is almost as if when we do that, we are saying these believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom Christ died for, they have been brought from death to life. And the most important right of these believers above my personal freedoms is their right to life. The eternal life they've been given to God and I'm not going to cause them to fall and stumble and even fall away from following Christ because my actions push them outside of following Christ. They've been given life by Christ, and I'm not going to, to cause them to stumble. And so this stumbling, causing others to stumble, indeed, is a serious offense. And then Chrysostom will point out that if, we are set one, if you are set your right as a Christian, then you are a cruel Christian. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being our God, and we pray that you will help us to live to you and not live for ourselves. For your church, let's love our church, and help us, Lord, to always evaluate ourselves. We may not know, we are not saying we know everything here, but help us, Lord, as we study this more and more, to be able to find ourselves on the right side of godliness and pleasing to you and the gospel life. In Jesus' name, amen.